Praise the Lord. Gives me great joy this afternoon to be with all of you. I was celebrating the morning 9.15 mass here in our parish. And after that, when I stepped in here, I had a lot of feelings of joy to see so many of you, my dear youngsters. So shall we, before I begin the session itself, want all of you to clap hands for each other because of this wonderful number that has come here. And I congratulate the organizers in a very special manner for this beautiful time. Well, I'm not a very big fan of movies, but there are some dialogues which I know or remember uh, you know, can be used. This one particular dialogue goes something like this. How's the Josh? How's the Josh? Okay, so instead of saying, hi, sir, can you say, hi, father? How's the Josh? How's the Josh? And who's your king? I can't hear you. Who's your king? Can you lift up your right hand and say that? Who's your king? Jesus. How's the Josh? How's the Josh? And who's your king? Jesus. Little more louder. Who's your king? Jesus. Okay, what about this? God is good. All and all the time. God. Another one. Jesus loves me now and always. Okay? Jesus loves me. Now and, and now and always. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Now, and and now and always. Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. All God's people say, Amen. All God's people say, Amen. Little more louder, All God's people say, Amen. Praise God. I really thank God for, and I especially thank all the speakers, especially Brother Cherian, who has infused in us that spirit of rejoicing. This morning, we're looking at those three words return, repent, rejoice in order to have another re that is revive revival in right uh, uh, revival in life so you return you repent you begin to rejoice and all this helps you to have a revival in your life and so i invite you my dear brothers and sisters my dear young friends in the lord all of us are young right hello how's the josh all of us are young in the Lord. We know that one of the most important, distincting features of someone who is young is that that person is supposed to be enthusiastic. We know this is one word that is often used, enthusiastic. The Hindi version of that is Josh. My name is Jijo Jos. I remember when I came to the degree college, I am the vice principal of a degree college in Electronic City, St. Francis de Sales Degree College. When I came there the first time when I was introduced, I was introduced, my name was mispronounced as Jijo Josh. Instead of Jos, it became Josh. I think it's fairly fine for me because I would love to have a lot of Josh. This word enthusiasm is something that we all would love to have in our life. But my dear young friends, remember, this word enthusiasm has something divine behind that. This word enthusiasm has a divine connotation or an explanation behind that. This word enthusiastic comes from two Greek words. How many of you know here Latin, French, Greek? No, okay. I know just two words, okay? So I'm not going to try to boast. Two Greek words called en and theos. En, that is E-N, and theos, that is T-H-E-O-S. What's the meaning of theos? Some of you can guess that word. Meaning of that word, theos. From there we get theology. Theo. God. By the way, I just want to say something as Brother Cherian was taking the session and he was asking all of you what is the name of God. He got an answer. I'm not sure if he noticed, but I was right there at the side. I was observing all of you. The first answer and the right answer came not from any of here, but had to come from this one child right at the edge here. What's your name, child? Joanna was the one who actually answered. As you finished your question, immediately she jumped up and said, I am is the name of God. Can we give a big hand to Joanna? 
you know and i was thinking the josh and the enthusiasm that she was radiating every time brother was asking a question to y'all she was somehow trying to guess what's that answer what's that answer and i was quite observing her wonderful joanna grew up to become a wonderful soldier for christ this word enthusiasm as i said com comes from two greek words en and theos theos as we can more or less guess means god theos means god this word en stands for in or inside so therefore what's the root meaning of the word enthusiasm en and theos in or inside god or god inside of you so the next time you ask yourself or others are you enthusiastic begin to understand from a christian perspective what does that mean it simply means that if god is in you or you are in god you cannot but become enthusiastic that's why we find the first disciples we have in the first chapter of saint john when the disciples encountered jesus the first disciples one of them andrew would go to his brother simon peter and say we have found the messiah when you have that experience of encountering jesus in your life that's the transformation that comes and this day is given to all of you my dear young friends to have that revival in the lord and for this revival we understand we need to come before god to have a purification of our hearts therefore i invite all of you for a moment to stand as i invite and request the choir to also lead us into this time of praise and worship as we sing to the lord purify my heart so that i may become more and more like god this is a hymn i believe most of us are knowing the words are simple the tune is not too complicated we can try to learn this one so let's therefore join the choir as we seek and pray to the lord purify my heart o oh lord to know can be joined together let me be as gold and precious silver purify my heart let me be as gold pure gold refine as fine one desire my heart's one desire tell your desire to be holy is to be arise from your heart let me be sing to him and precious silver purify my heart make it your prayer let me be as gold pure shall we lift up our hands and sing together Re
the Lord that you're ready to do His will. Lord, I'm ready to do Your One more time, Lord, I'm ready to do Your will. Yes, I'm ready to do Your One last time, Lord, I'm ready to do Your will. Lord, I'm ready to do your right hand on your heart as we offer our lives to the Lord completely. Loving and merciful Lord, as you give to us this beautiful day to return to you, to repent of our sins and to rejoice in you, we pray that you may work a revival in our hearts. Purify Lord our hearts that we may offer ourselves to you completely. Lord, I make a pledge to you this moment that I'm ready, ready to do your will and live a life of holiness. Maybe, Lord, in the past, I have gone away from you, but right now, I wish to come seeking your mercy, your forgiveness. Accept me, Lord, as I am. Mary, my blessed mama, intercede and pray for me. Together we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. And all God's people say, Amen. All God's people say, Amen. One more time, and all God's people say, Amen. Shall we give a big clap to the Lord who has called us to a life of holiness? Kindly be seated. How many of you like to listen to stories? Stories? Okay. I believe that Jesus himself loved a lot of stories. And that's the reason if you look into his preaching, he would most of the time begin with a story or a parable or giving a day-to-day -day illustration. I'm also as a preacher, as a priest, someone who loves to say a lot of stories in my preaching, in my homilies. In one of the store and many of the stories, I use a person named Johnny. So there's this person, any Johnny out here, by the way? Okay, okay, thankfully, okay. So we have got the story of Johnny, all of seven years old. He was someone who loved to do a lot of craft work. You know, remember in school days, we used to have a subject called craft. No? I think this side of the people, the girls over here might enjoy that more. At least I know myself as boys. Craft, okay, okay. Somehow manage. It was one class where you could enjoy. You know, usually the craft teachers are quite joyful and nice people. So you actually enjoy that class. Even if you don't do much work, you'll get up your attendance and things like that. So this boy, Johnny, was someone who loved to do craft work. And one day he decided to make a boat. Boat? B-O-A-T, boat, not your boat headphones, your boat, uh, no, a boat. And decided to do that with using some scrap wood. So there was some work done in his house and he had some wood was left over. So using that, he began to build a small little boat. He did that very nicely and then also painted that boat with his favorite colors, blue and white. Some of you out here, Josephites, anyone here? Blue and white is our, I'm also a Josephite from Arts and Science, that's our colors, blue and white. Okay, so this boy painted that in blue and white and he made that very wonderfully, kept it for drying and now he was ready to play with his boat. There was a stream that is flowing right down his house, so he went down to the stream and he was all set to let his beautiful creation, his blue and white boat, to be set sailing and to play with that. With much excitement and joy, little Johnny would allow his boat to go into the waters of the stream. It was a small stream and he allowed that to go into that. But we'll call it fortunately and unfortunately. In fact, you know, these are not terms used to be, to be used by a Christian. For us, there's nothing. What is this? Hanebara, in Kannada you say that, no? Everything is written here. Nothing is written over here. For us, everything is in the plan and will of God. So if any of you are using words like lucky, fortunate, try to change your vocabulary. For us, nothing happens luckily. Nothing happens fortunately. Of course, maybe we are used to using those words. Let's try to refine that. Everything happens in the will of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 
can some of you quickly take that gospel verse is something that can be easily learned by heart romans 8 28 all things work together for good for those who love god everything in life happens for good if you love god so if you believe in the word of god if you have faith and trust in god there's nothing luck determines your life there's nothing like you know something is written in my fate no so this boy was ready to set sail his boat but that day somehow there was a lot of wind and at the moment of his setting sail the boat a strong gush of wind came and this boat set sailing faster than johnny expected what happened the boat began to travel downstream faster than he expected he ran across the shore trying to catch his boat but the wind was too strong and his beloved creation went out of his sight. You can imagine the pain or the sadness that little Johnny had. A wonderful creation was lost, maybe lost forever. He came back home very sad, dejected. Two or three days he was very upset, not talking with anyone, not going out anywhere. Finally, it was Sunday and his parents said, shall we go for a shopping journey? You know, they wanted to make his mood up not like us who go for window shopping often you go to malls with no cash in your pocket you move around as if you're going to purchase all your hill figures and you know your i don't know what all things you want to purchase there'll be no pocket no no cash in your pocket but you do what is called as window shopping so his parents said we shall not go for window shopping we'll actually go for shopping just to cheer up johnny and as he went that way, as they were passing through the marketplace, Johnny noticed in one particular shop, a stationery or a kind of a, you know, where you get these craft work, he noticed his same boat that is kept on the window display. Now Johnny was all excited, told his parents, Mama, Daddy, I've got my boat, let me go to this shop and get it for me. He went there and he told the shopkeeper, hey, that boat which you're displaying is mine. Please give it back to me. And we know shopkeepers will not just like that give unless you pay their money. What guarantee do you have that it's yours? You check, it's my favorite colors. It's the one, the design I have done. The shopkeeper said, nothing doing. I will not give you that. And then Johnny kept on pleading and finally the shopkeeper said, if you want to take that boat, pay the money for this boat and get it. Well, little Johnny tried he wanted to somehow get back his creation, went and pursued it, his father, Daddy, please do something and pay this money. I want back my creation to me. And Daddy consented to this little boy's request, paid the money due for that boat. The shopkeeper took the boat, gave it to little Johnny's hands. And as Johnny got the boat, his creation back into his hands, he made a wonderful statement. He spoke to the boat and said, Oh, little boat, you are mine. Remember, you are mine. You are twice mine. Once because I created you and twice because I got it back. Once because I created you and twice because I got you back. My dear young friends in the Lord, this afternoon, the Lord taking all of us, the boats, the little creations of his heart, takes us into his hands and tells to each one of us something similar. You are mine. You are twice mine. Once because I created you and twice because I have got you back. Are you willing to go back to the Lord and hear those powerful words that are coming to you this afternoon telling you to come back to his love my dear brothers and sisters the season of lent is a time where god wants all of us to understand on one side the worth of our life when i as a priest go around to different parishes different groups communities and i interact especially with youngsters I understand there is a lot of difficulty that youngsters today are finding. And one important difficulty that many of you also are facing is something like this. I don't seem to be having any worth in my life. Somehow, people don't consider me seriously in life. 
This may begin in your own families. Maybe you don't have much of a voice in your family. You come to your college and you come to your class friends and things like that. Again, you seem to be quite lost. Today, we have many of us who seem to be going down, losing and failing to understand the worth of our life. And because of this, what happens? We end up seeking the worth of our life through various other means. I've got many examples to give. I limit myself to just one or two. How many of us here love to take selfies? Most of us love to take selfies. Okay, you don't want to confess, it's fine. But I know in general that's been, in fact, you know, maybe the trend of taking selfies was quite strong some years back. It's now kind of getting over, you know, kind of we've reached a saturation point. But I remember when Facebook and Instagram, there was before something called as Orkut. Any of you had an Orkut account? O-R-K-U-T? Orkut account, that was the first one that got expired and then we had Facebook, you had WhatsApp, you got Instagram, and things like that. You know, when all these things started coming into fashion, many of us would love to take selfies. And we know the traditional way you ask some of the seniors over here, if I ask you to take a photograph, how do you take a photograph? Right, I mean, that's been the traditional way of taking a photograph, right? But today, I don't think any of us would any time want to take a selfie standing the way I did, right? You will try to do something creative, right? So your creativity sometimes goes to an extent wherein you either endanger yourself, you take a risk on your physical self, or you endanger your moral life. Those who have ears, let them hear, says the Lord. I hope you got my point. For example, if I want to picture myself with a little dangerous photo, I'll try to stand at this edge. I don't know, I'm trying to lift up my other leg and try to balance myself out here. I'm fairly okay, it's not too risky. But try to do that at the edge of a cliff. You've got waterfalls and you go right at the edge of that and you take a stunning selfie. Why do you want to do that? Because your friend last week uploaded one and that friend got 974 likes. You uploaded a regular, normal photograph and you just got 51 likes. There should be some problem with me. If that person of mine who I know is not that very stunning or handsome, etc., can get 971, why can't I get better? What I'm trying to say is that you are beginning slowly to understand the worth of your life, not in the way God is looking at you, but in the way society looks at you, the way social media tells you, and you begin to look at yourself lower and lower. I spoke about the physical danger. We understand also sometimes the moral dangers that we enter into when you want to take a selfie. A regular, full-dressed photograph may not get many likes if you are willing to take a little step and, if I can use that word, expose myself a little bit by number of likings and share will increase. That girl did that last week, that boy did that last week, and you know how many likes he got. If he can, why can't I? Let me give it a try. My dear young friends, today many of us have entered into this danger zone wherein you're beginning to see the worth of your life not in the way God looks at you but in the judgment of the society of your friends itself. To all of you who are going through this kind of a struggle, a crisis in life, God's word comes to you and tells you are worthy, you are wonderful the way you are. Whenever I meet youngsters, I use this quotation. Remember, my dear young boys and my dear young girls, you may not be as handsome and as beautiful as you appear in your Facebook profile picture, and you're not as bad as you appear on your Aadhaar card. Make sense? Okay, so your Facebook profile page, you always try to add maximum beauty possibilities, and you do that. You may not be in reality that, okay? But you're also not as bad as you appear in your Aadhaar card. You're much, much better than that. And God tells you, understand the worth of your life and begin to believe in Him. My dear brothers and sisters, the season of Lent is given to us as a time when God wants us to put our faith, our hope in Him and know that God loves, accepts me the way I am. 
I want to just discuss with you one verse from the book of Sirach. This book of Sirach is also called as Ecclesiasticus. There's another word, another book called Ecclesiastes, but in some Bibles it will be written as Ecclesiasticus or Sirach. Those of you who have your Bibles may take to the book of Sirach, chapter 2, verses 7 onwards. That's chapter 2 of the book of Sirach from verse 7. I read just one or two sentences. Trust God and he will help you make, st make straight your ways and hope in him. You who fear the Lord, wait for his mercy and turn not away lest you fall. Now there are many, many more verses are there. I just want to read one more verse, verse 11. Compassionate and merciful is the Lord. He forgives sins. He saves in time of trouble. He forgives sins and he saves in time of trouble. This afternoon, as we all, the preachers and the music team out here, as we are asking you to look into your life and make a change in your life, remember, you may perhaps encounter some of those bad phases of your life. You may not want to look into those areas of your life. You feel miserable and you ask yourself, can God really forgive me? The word of God tells us he is merciful, he is compassionate, he forgives each and every sin of your life. That's why I tell the ocean of God's mercy is greater than all your sins, failures and weaknesses. I repeat, the ocean of God's mercy is greater than all your sins, your weaknesses and failures. This afternoon after lunch, we would be having a time of confession. And I appeal to all of you to make an honest examination of your heart and go to the Lord for confession. Maybe you find it difficult to go for confession. Some of you may find it difficult to say some of the sins. But as it was mentioned in one of the talks, when you go for confession, remember, it is not to the priest you are going, you're going to speak to the Lord himself. Father, why should I go to Father for confession? Can't I go directly to God? No? Right? Why do we need to do that? Well, we must understand that God in his authority has given to us priests the gift of his forgiveness to be given. When you commit a sin, you commit a sin to your brothers and sisters, right? There's also a community dimension. If you have made a sin to one another, it's also right that one among us, a human representative, receives and learns your sins. Father will remember my sin and next time he meets me, he will scold me or he will look at me from that angle. Remember, all of us priests over here are bound by what is called as the confessional seal, a confessional secret. Whatever is told to us at confession, we as priests have a bounden sacramental duty not to reveal this to anyone. What will happen if I as a priest tell to anyone else anything that has happened in confession, I automatically cease to be a priest. It's called automatic excommunication or latte sentencia. That's the word used in canon law. So much is the gravity of the importance of confessional seal that a priest would be considered to be no longer a priest if he or she reveals his sin. Therefore, why is the church telling this? To tell all of us, you can be confident of telling anything of your sinful life to your priest. If you are willing to take that step, my brothers and sisters, God tells, his mercy is here to forgive you, to heal you. Some of us, you know, when we go for confession, we also look, I don't know if you all do that, in some places I've seen, when you have a choice of many priests, you will try to go to a little elderly priest. Have you done that? You know, that father may not hear much. I can manage, I can escape and run away from there. Some of us, what we do in our confession, we tell our sins, but not directly. You make a huge story, in that story, somewhere your sentence, your sin will be there. It's something like this beautiful story told by one of my favorite authors and speakers, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He speaks about how a group of boys once came to him for confession and they started telling 
the confession. So the first boy who came knelt down before father and told him the sins. Among the many sins he told, father, I also have thrown peanuts into the water. Peanuts into the water. And the father was thinking, what is so big sin in that? He thought maybe child, no, maybe for him that was something big. He forgave the sin and went away. The second boy comes and says, among the many sins that he told, I have thrown peanuts into the water. And the father is thinking, what is this thing happening? You know, what's so special about this sin? Third person, same thing. Fourth person, same thing. Fifth guy comes and small fellow comes. And as he kneels down, father says, I suppose you also threw peanuts into the water. And to that the boy says, father, my name is Peanuts. Now, so sometimes you don't tell things in the way it is to be told. When you have committed a sin, please say your sin as it is. It's like another fellow, a group of naughty young boys in a catechism class. The teacher told and met this group of young naughty boys and told them, all of you have to go for confession today to the parish priest. They knew the parish priest was a very strict person. And you know, going to confess to him, he may, you know, scold us and be very, very harsh with us. So all these five fellows were sent to the parish priest and the five of them are waiting. Now, when five of you are going to get, there's always a dilemma, who will go first? You know, so you go, you go, no, no, you go, you go. Finally, one of them who is to always depict himself as the leader says, I will go. And he goes and, you know, he also is full of pride and haughty thing. He goes and kneels before father and says, father, I have committed all the possible sins in the world. Please forgive me. And father asks him, okay, that's interesting to hear. Let me ask you, have you committed murder? And the boy says, oh, that is one sin I missed out. I have not done that. So the priest told him, you know, boy, I think you have not made a proper examination of conscience. Please go, make a proper examination of conscience and then come back. And the boy goes out of confessional and tells his four other friends. The friends are waiting what happened kind of thing. No, he goes and says, Guys, today, no use of going for confession. Father is only listening to murder cases today. You know, so some of us have got such kind of wrong notions regarding confession. This afternoon, as you prepare yourself to go for the sacrament of confession, be honest, genuine, sincere, open. Be the way you are. And God is waiting for all of you to receive you in mercy and forgiveness. And I tell you, if you are willing to let go of your sin and allow God to work in your life, you can have a life that is joyful, a life that is full of peace and love. Many of us, let's accept it. We are looking for love in our life. We are looking for peace of mind. We are looking for joy. So many of us, we know we are trying to study, but things are not happening. So now you have left that case. Studies is not my cup of, what do you call that? Cup of tea, cup of coffee, whatever. It's not mine. Let me just manage to get 35, 40%. Later when placement happens, I'll see what can be done. We'll try to, you know, with our smile, we'll try to win over the HR manager and get a job. Well, to those of you who feel hope is not there in life this afternoon, God tells you, do not lose your hope. Come to me in confession. Come to me repenting of all your sins and you will find the Lord telling you, you are mine, you are twice mine and you belong to me. Let's therefore for a moment now stand as we break for lunch. I invite the choir to also help us to lead us into the singing of the hymn, Change My Heart, O God. And as we would be moving to this time of lunch, I invite you to also spend some time of the lunch thinking also what happens post lunch. We have the confessionals. Please do go through some areas of your life. Some of you may have sins in your life which you have not confessed for a long time. Today is a day when God is inviting you. Take that one courageous step towards the Lord. The prodigal son did that. And when he did that, the father ran to him and embraced him. If that time there was a camera person there, and if somebody had captured that moment, the father embracing the son, we would have had a wonderful photograph with us. And I believe God wants all of us a photograph with him in that posture. When you as a repentant person comes back to him and he as the loving father embraces you. 
Are you ready to have that photograph with your Abba Father who loves you and tells you, you are mine, you are twice mine forever. Let's therefore close our eyes, join our hands as we sing to the Lord to change our hearts and make us anew. you pray, change my heart. Change, change my, my heart, heart, oh Lord. And tell him, may I be like you. May, may I, I be like you. Let's now confess and tell you are the potter and I am the clay. You are the potter. Jesus, I believe in the same to you. Jesus, I believe. Sing it together with faith in your hearts. Jesus, I believe. One more time. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. I believe in you. Shall we lift up our right hands to the Lord and sing once again, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. Sing with faith in your hearts. Jesus, I believe. The touch of the Lord is here to anoint you. Jesus, I believe. I believe in you. time as we join our hands. Jesus, I believe. Let's join our hands. Jesus, I believe. Receive the grace and mercy of the Lord that is filling your hearts. Jesus, I believe. One more time, Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. time I believe in you I believe in you let's pray Jesus loving and merciful Savior I believe and I trust in you I believe and trust in the power of forgiveness that you have granted to all of us in the sacrament of confession reconciliation Lord I pray that you may move my heart to look into those areas of my life which needs a touch of repentance. If there is unforgiveness in my heart, Lord, I pray for the gift of forgiveness. If there is lust and impurity in my heart, Lord, I pray for purity. If there are sinful addictions in my heart of which I am not able to overcome, 
Lord, I pray for the gift of self-control, the gift of totally being focused on you. And I pray that you may free me of all my sins, that you may free me of all my affections, that you may free me of all my bad habits. And Lord, help me to live a new life in you. Mary, my blessed mother, Saint Joseph, and all the angels and saints, intercede and pray for me. Let all glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Jesus loves me. Now and always. And now and always. Jesus loves me. And all God's people say. Amen. All God's people say. Amen. And all God's people say. Amen. Shall we give a round of applause to our blessed Lord who has been so good to all of us. FS. May God bless all of us to live a wonderful and a joyful life in him. Praise God.